All right. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter number 6 here, let's start reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So what's happening here is, you know, the church has grown by leaps and bounds. The church has just, has just expanded, you know, um, up to this point, up to, up to Jesus Christ, um, the nation of Israel was the lighthouse. The nation of Israel is where, you know, God was, was revealing his word. Um, they had the temple, they had the tabernacle, and it was kind of centralized, like the things of God were centralized in that nation, in, in his chosen people that he chose to reveal his word through and to do this stuff. Now, we know that, that a lot of people had come from other places and they became Jews, they became proselytes, they believed on the Lord, and they were not excluded, you know, they were allowed to come in and, and, and believe on God and get saved, you know, and, that's, and they did that, but see... All the teaching and everything was, was, was really just heavily located still, like physically within that realm. Well, after the resurrection of Christ, you know, they were taught to go out then unto the Gentiles. And that, and that the Gentiles then were going to be preached the word so that they didn't just keep everything focused like in Jerusalem. They didn't just keep everything in one place. They went out and now they were starting to and, and just bring you know, everyone in and they were going out. And the word of God really spread abroad. It wasn't just kind of confined to that one area. So what's happening here now, because, I mean, this is a new thing. The church is growing. There's a, there's a, a lot of growth, a lot of things going on. The Grecians, that's the, the Greeks, you know, people who are of Greece, they started complaining because, you know, basically what was happening is that their widows weren't being taken care of. And we're going to get into that real quick of the, the role of, of the church and with widows Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Now I'm going to read for you from James at the end of, end of James chapter 1. The Bible reads in verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So pure religion, the Bible says, if you have good religion, if you have pure religion, it is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. One of the jobs of the church is to take care of widows. And this is what they were complaining about in Acts chapter, in verse number one of chapter six, is they're saying, look, the Greeks that became part of the church, you know, they, they're believers, they became part of the church. They're complaining because they're saying, hey, wait, you know, nobody's taking care of our widows. Which would lead me to think that the, the Jews' widows probably were being taken care of, but it was just like the Grecians. The Greeks saying, hey, well, what about us? You know, like our, our widows are here, they need to be taken care of too. And um, you could kind of see how this would happen with, with that being new, like kind of going out to the Gentiles and this massive growth and there's, you know, there's all the stuff going on, something like that's being overlooked. Now, this is something that the church is responsible for. And churches have always been responsible for something that, that God has put this burden on the church to take care of widows now. But there's, there's requirements for that too. It's not just any widow. And we're going to see if you're in 1 Timothy chapter number 5. I think that's where I told you to go. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, honor widows that are widows indeed. And he's going to explain what that is. What is a widow indeed? But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and, and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So he's saying first, in verse number four, he's saying, look, first, if any widow, if you have children, if you have nephews, if you have family, basically, the family's supposed to take care of you. That's first. And, and God put that for you. He said, look, your family that's who, who takes care of you. That's who's supposed to support you in time of need. I mean, if you have a relative, a you know, someone in kind of your, your immediate family or your, your, your first extended, you know, it goes into nephews, aunts, uncles, you know, people like that, your parents, your children, you need to take care of them. You need to be responsible and take care of your family when they have times of need. I mean, if you have, you know, an aunt or someone, you know, um, someone else in your family that's widowed, and they need help. I mean, they can't work. They can't support themselves. You're supposed to take care of them. Grandparents, 
take care of them. That's your job as a family member. That's what we're supposed to do. But this is talking about, okay, you don't have any family. There's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of women, especially widows. I mean, typically they're older. They're not able to do any, you know, they're not able to really support themselves very well. And maybe their husband had died and he was a breadwinner as it should, as it should be. And they need help. And then the Bible saying here in verse 5, it says, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate, meaning she doesn't have anybody, trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So someone who's a widow indeed is going to be one that trusts in God is what, is what he's saying. Like, this is what I mean by widow indeed. They trust in God and they continue in supplications and prayers night and day. They're faithful to God. They're going to be faithful to church. They're going to be listening to these things in, you know, and obeying God. And, and um, you know, that's basically how they're living their life. It says, but in verse 6, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So again, he goes back to saying, look, widows that have family members, widows that have... Um, other family to take care of them, their family is supposed to take care of them. And if they don't, if, if any man provide not for his own, it says, you've denied the faith. You're worse than an infidel. An infidel is someone who doesn't believe in God, someone that, that, that denies the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, if you don't take care of your own family, you're worse than an infidel. You're worse than that. That's the importance that God puts on just supporting your family, being there to, to help your family out. It's a big deal. God, you know, um, created the family structure and the family authority and and what you're supposed to do with your family and you know take care of each other for a reason. The Bible says in verse 9, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. So first of all, he's saying, look, a widow shouldn't be taken into the number, meaning like taken into the churches, um, you know, taking care of them, being under three score. Three score is 60. A score is 20. So three score is 60 years old. So they have to be at least 60 years old. And then he says, having been the wife of one man. So this isn't someone that's just divorced or whatever, you know, and that's why she's, you know, obviously she, she's widowed because her husband died, but she was the wife of one man. It says, well reported of for good works. So this is someone who's known for being a good, you know, a good person and doing good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So this is saying, look, they've got to be 60. They've got to be, a, you know, have done a lot of good things, live, you know, be a, be a good person and have helped people out and have, you know, done all these good works and have just kind of lived a godly life. And then it says in verse 11, but the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So he's saying, look, basically this is what's going to happen. He said, the younger widows, you refuse them because what's going to happen then is that they're going to just learn to be idle. You're going to be taking care of them. They're not going to marry anyone. You know, they're just going to, they're, they're going to be, have idle time. They're not going to have anything to do. And they're just going to be learning to be busybodies. You know, they're going to learn to be getting in other people's business and just gossiping and just talking about other people. And then that's what they do with their time, speaking things which they ought not. That's why the Bible is saying to younger widows, they're supposed to just get married again. Find another husband, get married, you know, bear children, guide the house, and do all the things that a woman is supposed to do, especially a younger woman. And he says, um, and that's why he says in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them. And let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So here again we see, look, if you have widows, if you have widows in your family, take care of them. The church doesn't need to be charged for them. But the church is responsible for those they don't have family. They have no one to take care of. There's, you know, they live a good life, and they, you know, they need someone to, to help them out. And that's exactly what the church is for. And that's exactly what our church is going to do too. We'll help widows who are widows indeed. But we're going to refuse the younger ones. We're going to, you know, this this is this is a guideline that's given out to us 
I mean, this is the instructions to Timothy on how the church is supposed to be operating. So we see here a little bit, you know, this, this extra support, a little extra evidence, and just um, just try to show you what's going on here in Acts chapter 6. Because it was the church's responsibility to take care of these widows. Now let's go back to Acts chapter number 6. We're going to keep reading here in verse number 2. It says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So here we see, okay, there's a problem in the early church. The disciples are being multiplied. The church is growing. And... Not all of the needs of the church ended up being met because they, they had grown so much so fast. And it's evident here that the 12 apostles were primarily the ones responsible for, for running the church, for, for making sure that things operated um, you know, smoothly in the way that they were supposed to within the church because it says that the, you know, the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So they're saying, look, we need to keep doing the things that we were doing. Now, this work of, of you know, taking care of the widows, it's an important work. It needs to be done. The regular, this needs to be done. But that's not the job that we're going to be doing. We're going to continue doing, continue to, to keep ourselves under prayer and to doing the work of the ministry. That's what we're going to keep on doing. You know, we're, we're doing a good job. But we need to appoint people to be over this business. Now, the Bible is kind of laying out here. It's not, it's not literally telling us exactly the way the church is to be organized, but, but we can infer that from this chapter that there's definitely an organization of how the church is supposed to be laid out. You know, you have a, a pastor, which is also referred to in the Bible as a bishop or as the elder, and then the other office that you have within the church are the deacons. So what we see here is, you know, the, the, 12, the 12 apostles, 12 disciples are would be in that position of like an elder, a bishop, you know, a pastor. And the church was so big, there was more than one. You know, in the smaller churches, there's no need to have more than one person as like the main overseer. But, you know, if you're running thousands, you know, you have a multitude of people, yeah, you're going to you're gonna need more people involved just to manage that many people, to, to, to manage the church and to, you know, and to make sure everything's being done. So what we see here is the appointment. They're telling them to look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint, appoint over this business. So this is business of, in the way they describe it, as serving tables. Now, it needs to be done. It's the church's job. We've already established that. But it's not the same, I don't know if it's the same, you know, it's called the same level of work, but it's a, you know, it's a different type of function. It's a different job that needs to be done within the church. And this is why deacons are appointed to, to be over this business. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives the qualifications for the pastor and a deacon. I'm going to turn there real quick because we're going to go over this a little bit. I'm going to use this time in Acts chapter 6 to kind of explain a little bit how the church is supposed to be run, how it's supposed to be set up. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is because today we have Baptist churches that they're not, it's not a scriptural organization, especially when it comes to the deacons. And part of the reason for this is because churches have kind of patterned themselves off of our worldly government, our worldly system, and the constitution, and kind of the way things are, where the deacons are more of like a board, and they kind of like vote on things, and, and they're like the legislative branch, while the, the pastor is like the executive branch, and like they're the figurehead. But the deacons like vote on stuff, and they're the ones that kind of make all the decisions in the church. That's not that's not the way that the Bible lays out the, the the roles and the functions within a church. So we see here. I mean, the deacons were appointed there, and the deacons really what they are is ministers. That's what they're doing. They're there to minister. They're there to serve the people, the the members of the church. They're not just just making up rules for everyone now. The Bible gives qualifications for the pastor and for the deacons. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. The Bible says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. We turn to this out soul winning today. 
um, Brother Sebastian was, was talking to a lady who was Catholic, and he was just trying to explain. He's like, yeah, you know, I was Catholic too. And he was explaining to her, well, this is one of the reasons why I don't go to a Catholic church. I mean, they're, they're, they're blatantly not following what the Bible says and how, and how the church is supposed to be laid out. You know, like, he's ba he was basically trying to explain to her, you know, I want to go to a church where they're doing things right the way that the Bible says and not where they're just obviously just completely in violation of what the Scripture says. So he turned us and showed her, like, look, see the bishop? says they must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Well, the Catholic Church, they're not allowed to be married. They forbid to be, they, they're forbidden to be married, and they abstain from meats, which, you know, again, that's found elsewhere in the Bible, but um, that's what they do. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. The Bible lays out clearly, look, the bishop needs to be the husband of one wife. Now, if the bishop needs to be the husband of one wife, I want to know for all these, these female pastors, who are they the husband of? Because the Bible says to be the husband of one wife. I don't think they're anybody's husband. The Bible says, it doesn't say be the wife of one husband. It says be the husband of one wife. That's what the bishop is supposed to be. That's the bishop's role. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. These are all qualifications that, that a person must have prior to even be considered to be a bishop of a church, to be a pastor. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And again, it's impossible to have your children in subjection with all gravity if you don't have any children. These are all qualifications. We need to look at this carefully. When you're looking at a church, you're looking at a pastor, I mean, this is, is it biblical? Are you following what the Bible says? It says, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Having a family and ruling your house well and, 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 and being a ruler over your children and um, your wife being in subjection and these things are, are just will demonstrate what type of a leader are you? Are you going to be able to take care of a church full of people if you can't even take care of your own family? If you don't even know how to lead well enough for your children just to listen to you, obey you, not to be just unruly nightmares, but to but actually listen to you with gravity and have respect towards you? How is anyone else going to respect you if, if your own children don't respect you as a father? That's basically what he's saying here. It gives a good indication of the type of leader you're going to be. Then it says, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he shall fall in the condemnation of the devil. I mean, a novice, not someone who's just newly saved, doesn't really know much of anything, but they're going to get up and lead a bunch of people. No, you need to study. You need to learn. You need to study to show yourself approved unto God. Um, you know, otherwise, it's very easy. It's explaining here that to be lifted up with pride. I mean, you get people following you, you'd be lifted up with pride, and you're going to fall in the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So it's also, you have to be reported of, just in general, for people in the world, that, you know, you're, you're a decent guy. You're an honest guy. You're not someone who's just you know, a con artist or whatever. You know, you've got a good report. It says, likewise, now we're going to talk about the deacons. Must the deacons be grave? That means serious, you know, sober. Not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. You don't want people in that office that are, that are just in it for the money, that are just focused on getting money. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So again, this isn't something you'll get proved after you're put into the office. That's why he said in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, he says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. If they're of honest report, that means people speak well of them. They're, they're known for good works. They're full of the Holy Ghost. They preach the word. They have boldness. And they have wisdom. They know the Bible. These are the people you're looking for first in order to point them over this business. You don't get all this stuff after you become an elder, after you become a deacon. These are things that you need to have first. These are qualifications to hold that position. And then look at this. It says, even so must their wives be great. Now, the deacon is filling a role in the church. That's a man filling a role. But this is giving now qualifications even for their wife. So you might have a man in the church that fits these qualifications. But I'll tell you what, if their wife is not grave, if their wife is a slanderer, if their wife is not sober or faithful in all things, that person shouldn't be a deacon. You need to look at both of them. The Bible lays out here a qualification even for the deacon's wife. It says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. 
So again, a deacon, just as in a bishop, they need to be married. They need to have children. This is someone that you're looking out in order to put over this role. It says, For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So he lays out all this stuff, and this is these are the two main offices that the church should have. And obviously, excuse me, you don't need to have deacons in a church of our size. There's just not a need for it. The reason why they even appointed these men as deacons in that church is because, hey, there were, there were responsibilities of the church, these are things the church was supposed to be doing that they weren't doing, they were lacking, they were failing in those things because there wasn't enough people to get the job done. I mean, the disciples were out, they were teaching, they were preaching, they were praying, they were doing all these things that, that are good and they were devoted to doing, but all this other work wasn't getting done. And the bigger you get, especially as a church, there's a lot more things you got to do. There's a lot more people to take care of. Um, you know, the pastor, that word, is, is like a, a shepherd. That's someone who's supposed to be looking over the flock. So my job as pastor, I'm not just someone who comes up and preaches and teaches the Bible, although that is important. That's definitely something that I do. It's not just to go out and, and, and win the loss to Christ and try to bring them in, but it's also to, to care about the flock, to care about the church, and to try to help them and to be a personal encouragement to them and to, and to do things to, to help everybody individually grow and to do things for them. That's what a good pastor does. The pastor looks out for, for, you know, for bad things, for sin, calls it out and, and, and tries to, to give the, the people more knowledge and, and to help them out in that regard and, and to help them to look out for things that are, that are going to be bad in their lives. But... Um, you know, these are the, and, and there's certain qualifications that must be met in order to make that position. Now, um, obviously, the bigger church gets, the more you have need for these people to step up and do this kind of work. And you notice, too, they, they're looking for men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. This isn't just some meaningless job. Okay? A lot of times when you read that, you know, it, it, it's not me, reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables to make it sound like it's nothing, like it's just meaningless. Like, oh, yeah, we're just serving tables. Because it's not. It's not just. It, it's not exactly what the the disciples were doing. But it's not. Um, it's not meaningless. It's, it's really important because. I mean, those people matter. Those widows matter. They needed help. They needed to be taken care of, and that's the function of the of the church. Now, it's also important to understand this too, especially within church and within different churches, that different people perform different functions. Go ahead and, if you would, turn to First Corinthians chapter number twelve. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, because we're going we're to read here about some different functions that you can play, that you can have, and different roles that you have in the church. And, and 1 Corinthians 12 does a really good job of explaining that. Look, just because they're different doesn't make one superior to the other. A lot of people, and as you grow in this church, there's going to be different things. There's different skills that you have. There's different things that you're apt to do and things that you're good at. And that is just, whatever that is, whatever talents you have, whatever God has blessed you with, Use that to be an asset to the church. Bring that to glorify God. I mean, the pastor doesn't have all of the skills that's needed for everybody and for everything to operate. I have certain skills that God has given me. I believe that God has given me an ability to teach, an ability to do some other things, which is why I'm in this specific role. But there's lots of other roles to take within the church besides just being a pastor. I mean, we need someone to be able to play the piano so that we can also add instruments and add music into our singing praises unto God. That's one role in the church that can help. I mean, you can look at that one individual and be like, oh, I, all I do is just play the piano. Hey, that's a good function. And let's look and read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because this, is a, this explains this better than I could explain it. God's word. 1 Corinthians 12, look at verse number 4. It says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. So there's lots of different kinds of gifts, but it's all coming from the same spirit. Verse number 5, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the inter interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, 
dividing every man severally as you will. So we listed off all kinds of things here, whether it be you know being able to speak other languages, being able to heal people, you know, faith, knowledge, wisdom, all these things. God's given these to different people. He's given these different abilities and different skills to different people. But it's all from the same spirit. It's all from God, and it all comes from the same spirit. He's given it to us. It says, dividing every man severally as he will, and according to God's will, he'll, he'll divvy up those different gifts and different talents of people. It says, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So he's saying, look, our physical bodies have many members. You have fingers, you have toes, you have elbows, arms, you know, a head, ears, eyes, nose, everything. All of these different parts, they're all individually, they're all individual members, but they come together to make up one whole. And this is what he's referring to. He said, this is even as, so also is Christ. So he's saying, look, there's many members that to Christ's body, and they're members individually, but they come together to make one whole. Verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. So we're saying here, look, you know, just because the, you know, the foot, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Like, just saying, well, I'm just a foot. I'm not part of the body if I'm not at least the hand. Or, the, you know, he's, just, he's using this illustration saying, look, they all serve their own purpose and their own function. And you're all part of the body. Regardless of what that function is, whether it's something that's, that's honorable. I mean, your feet, I mean, you can look at it like, you know, your feet can kind of stink sometimes and they can hurt. But, but how important are your feet? I mean, they allow you to, to walk, to get to places. Now, they might not look very pretty, they might not look very nice, just aesthetically, but they have a very great function. Your hands. Your hands can say, oh, well, man, I can't, I can't allow you to walk and, and get places and do that. That's really important. But you can do a lot of things with your hands. You can hold tools. You can grab things. You can, you know, I mean, there's so many other things. So you shouldn't have this attitude. And I think this is one of the things he's trying to point out here is looking on some other function. And being like, oh man, I'm, I, well, I'm, I'm just worthless. I've got no value to add. You know, I'm not the pastor of the church, so what can I do? I'm not the song leader. I'm not the piano player. I'm not, you know, whatever, whatever function. I'm not a deacon. Don't look at it that way. You have your own skills, your own ability. God has given everybody here talents and abilities and skills, and, and he's divided unto us as his will is, the, you know, these different gifts and different things that we have. What we need to do is focus on those things and bring and use them to bring honor and glory unto God and to be part of the body as one whole. Um, I keep reading here. It says, um, and the eye cannot, I'm in, I'm in verse number um, 21, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So you say, look, you can't just say, oh, we don't need, the eye can't say the hand, oh, I don't need you. We don't need you to be part of the body. Because what he's saying here, look, even the, one, the ones that seem to be more feeble, the ones that seem to not be that useful, are the most useful. They're more necessary. It says, and those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. For one mem or one member, member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, 
First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet shall I unto you a more excellent way. So he's saying, look, if one member is going to suffer, we shall suffer. I mean, we're all part of the same body here, being in church. We're different members, individuals. Yes, we're all individuals. And we all bring our own thing to the table. But when one person's suffering, we should all be suffering with them. When one person's rejoicing, we should all be rejoicing with them. We're all part of the same body here. We're all headed the same direction. And that's why it's important that we're here, you know, in the church. Not everyone has the same talents. Not everyone has the same gifts. God has a specific use for all of us. God has a, a, a vision and a plan for your life. And he has a, 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 a spot for you. He has a role for you to play within this church. I believe that God has a role for you to play within this church. And that even though we're different, we all need to be working together because we're all part of the same body. And that's why it's important that we're all like-minded in our faith. We're all together. We're in one accord. We're in one place. Because if you have people in the church... And, you know, the left hand wants to do one thing and the right hand wants to do another. You're going to be getting pulled in two different directions. We need to all be on the same page. We all, and, you know, that's why it's really important that, you know, hopefully if I'm doing my job as a teacher, we could, we could all learn and come to the same conclusions of, of the truth of God's word so that we're not just pulled different directions doctrinally, like major doctrines. You're saying, well, some people are saying, well, I'm pre-trib and I'm post-trib and there's kind of different things going on or whatever it may be. I mean, I'm just using it as an example. You know, as dead sure not going to be anyone like, well, salvation, you know, you have to have works, or salvation is by grace, you know. We need to all be together in one accord as, as one body, because when the body, when, all the, fun, when all, the, all the members are here and everybody's working jointly together, we're going to get a lot of things done. When you're not just, just trying to do maybe your own thing, you know, think of what's going to benefit the body, what's going to benefit the church, not like... You know, not the finger thinking, well, what can I do to benefit myself? What can I do just to, to benefit me? We're going to benefit the whole body, you know, and, and, and be joy filled and joined together in one place. So here, you know, in the book of Acts, there's a lot of different people. And, and this is cool because we're going to see what happens with Stephen later. Stephen is one of the men that were appointed to serve tables. Stephen is one of the men that was appointed to watch, to watch over the widows and, and to, to fill, help fill that role of a deacon. But... Um, Stephen is a great man of God. And Stephen was used mightily of God, and God had his plan for his life. And that's all you can hope for is that, look, you don't know necessarily what God's will is for your life, but if you're, I mean, there's nothing better that you can do than be in God's will. So whatever that is, whatever his role is, whatever he's laid out for you, for your function to be within the church, if you're filling that role, there's nothing better you can be doing. It may not be the most honorable job, it may not be the, you know, the job that gets the most attention or the most accolades or whatever, um, but it doesn't make it less, any less important. Um, a lot of people look at a church and all the focus, just by default, gets, gets centered around the pastor because the pastor's the one up here, the pastor's the one talking, everyone else is sitting down listening and listening to the pastor. So, so it tends to become oftentimes a lot about the pastor, even though it's not about me. It's not, you know, obviously it's, it's the church about Christ, but... Don't get discouraged and don't be thinking like, oh, well, I can't do anything for church because I'm not the pastor. I'm not the one in the lead. That's not true at all. There, there's actually even more important jobs that you can be doing than me. I mean, I have to take some of my time and I have to study and I have to prepare sermons and I have to do a lot of other things in this role. If you don't have some of those same functions that need to be fulfilled, you could be doing more soul winning. You could be doing a lot of other things that really matter, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways even more to help other people. I mean, there's other things that you can be doing. There's people that you could be helping out. I mean, right now, yeah, we're small, but as we grow, we're going to be reaching a lot more people. So there's jobs, there's roles for you to do. Don't um, be discouraged in where you're at in the church. Um, and, and try to look at yourself and look at analyze your own skills and think, hey, what can I do to serve God better? What can I do? What am I good at? What, what has God gifted me with that I can really use? And then how am I going to use that? To, to, to become, you know, my member, to be my member as a part of the church and to really just, just honor God and to glorify Him and to, to use what He's given me 
to, to further you know, the, the goals of the church. Let's continue reading in Acts chapter 6. We're, we're in uh, verse number 4. Bob reads, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So here, we see the results of their actions. They see that there's a, there's a problem here. Hey, we're not getting to these widows. They're, we need to do this. We need to do something about this. So they set these men in these positions, putting men in that job. The apostles now are able to stay focused on their job. They're doing the role of the, the, the member that they play in the body. And they're saying, okay, well, we can't be all of these different body parts at once. We need to stay focused and be who we are. We're going to set people over this job and this responsibility. And that's the member of the body that you're going to be. And when they do that, we see the result of that. It says that um, the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. So when everybody's in their spot, everyone's in their roles, and everyone's getting things done, they can all focus on the job that they're supposed to be doing. Hey, man, everything's coming together great. And now they're starting to see a great increase. Now, again, they're back to the number of the disciples multiplying greatly. It doesn't seem to say a little bit. I mean, they multiplied greatly. And... Um, now we're kind of getting to a point in the book of Acts, and in chapter number six here, where it says, you know, the Bible starts to focus in on one of the men, as I mentioned earlier, one of the men that was appointed to serve tables. This is Stephen. And it says in verse eight, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So look at this. I mean, this guy that they appointed to, to, to help the widows and to, you know, to help take care of them, he was full of faith and power. This is a great man. He did great wonders and miracles among the people. This is, this is a guy that was totally being used of God. He was in his role, and you can say, oh man, he should have been in a different role. Look at it. He's doing miracles. He was doing wonders. No, he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was doing, he was in God's will. Um, we can't just, you know, he could have had the wrong attitudes. Oh man, I've been bitter. Like, I, I should be doing it. I should be doing what the disciples are doing. That's not what he was appointed to do. That wasn't his job. He was serving his job. He was doing his job very well, which is why he was able to even have this great power of God on him to be able to do these wonders and miracles. Verse number nine, it says, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So here's a bunch of people of these synagogues, you know, lists all these different types of people that become, and they're just arguing with Stephen. They just come and just, there's disputing with them. They're arguing with them. And then it says in verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So this Stephen was well-versed in the Bible. He had the boldness. He had the Holy Ghost. They're trying to argue with him. They're trying to dispute with him. They couldn't resist the wisdom. I mean, he was just like, he was just letting them have it. He was just winning all the arguments and just winning the debates and saying, look, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. And they just they couldn't they couldn't think of anything to say against them. They they knew they were losing. So let's see what happens. You know, Stephen was definitely given, I believe, the word of wisdom. And we read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That was one of the gifts of the Spirit. He had the word of wisdom because they weren't able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. But so what happens? They're not able to argue with the truth. So what do they end up doing? Look at verse 11. It says, Then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So suborned means like they um, they hired or the, it was, it's, it's hired, but like they hired them to, to do nefarious things. I mean, they were, they basically got these guys, they convinced these guys, they persuaded these guys to lie about Stephen. They can't answer him. They, they can't resist the truth. They have nothing to say against him. So what do they do? They just have to go and get someone to just lie about him. Verse number 12, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. So they go arrest him. They stir up, they get everyone mad. They, they you know, make a big fuss over Stephen and set up false witnesses which said, 
This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Again, man, that sounds real familiar because those are the same exact lies that they tried spewing against Jesus Christ himself. They set up false witnesses. They suborned men to do this because they could not resist the wisdom. They had to resort to lying. They couldn't beat him with the truth. They couldn't just, just argue with him. They couldn't trick him. They couldn't deceive him. They had nothing to say, so now they just have to lie. That's what they resort to. There's nothing new under the sun, and this is a very common practice, so... So prepare yourself for it. You see it happen over and over again. It happened to Jesus Christ. It happened to Stephen. And I'll tell you what, if you preach the truth boldly and for long enough, it's going to happen to you too. People are going to just start lying about you. People are going to start bringing railing accusations against you. It happened to, to my it happened to my former pastor all the time, Pastor Anderson. There's, a, there's even a guy that's been trolling the, the Word of Truth Facebook page. And he's just been posting stuff. And, it, and it's completely ridiculous. And, but, I, but I thought about this as I was reading this chapter because they've got nothing to do. They, they can't actually argue the Bible. They can't go and say like, oh, you know, based on the words that's coming out of his mouth, they can't just say, well, this is wrong, this is false, you know, this is a false doctrine because, well, you know, lay out an argument and say that's why. You have people that just have to resort to just making up accusations and lying and just making stuff up. So what this guy's doing, he's, he's gone on, our, on the Word of Truth page and he posted this this meme, this picture, right, where it shows like, it, and I don't know how many hours of footage he must have had to watch, but it's it's actually comical because there's one of the videos, Pastor Anderson was, you know, I mean, he's animated, he's dynamic, he's preaching, and they slowed it down, and, and his hands kind of looked like he was making that, you know, the devil horns thing, which now, oh, I'm being recorded, I better not do that because... They're going to take a still shot of me doing this right now, and they're going to say, see, look, he's of the devil, which is exactly what they did. They slowed down a video to where he was doing that, just, I mean, in passing, right? I mean, you can move your hands around like this, and when you slow it down frame by frame, you might find something and say, hey, yeah, that kind of looks like those double horns. So he slowed it down, he puts a picture of that up, and then he puts a picture of Alex Jones, like, you know, looking like he's doing the same thing. And then he puts, like, Anton LaVey and, like, these Satanists actually doing, you know, like intentionally like putting their fingers together and saying, see, look, you know, they're all of Satan. They're all workers of Satan. And that's just nothing but a false accuser and a railer. But it's ridiculous what they resort to. They just resort to lies. And the funny thing is he posted this clip because in the clip, this, this spot where he's saying he's doing the devil horns, what's actually coming out of Pastor Harris's mouth is he's saying like, you got to be saved by grace through faith. Like those are the words that's coming out of his mouth. You know, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It doesn't say out of the abundance of the, of the heart, the fingers do weird signs. You know what I mean? That's not how you judge whether or not something's right. You have to judge the content, judge what's coming out of a person's mouth. And when people can't resist the truth, when they have no answer, they're just going to resort to lying. Because they've got nothing else. They're going to cause up a big stir. They're going to cause up a fuss. Because they don't, these people especially, they can't stand to hear the truth. They don't want to hear it. They want to have nothing to do with it. It actually makes them angry. It's just to hear the truth. Someone's just preaching it, telling you like it is. This is the truth. I mean, these guys are going out. They're doing miracles. They're doing all kinds of great work. They're helping people out. They're visiting the widows. And what do they do? They have to just resort to lying about them because they just can't stand it. Because they're reprobate. Because they're of the devil. Because that they, just, they can't stand the truth. They want to have nothing to do with it. So they're going to do whatever they can to just get it to cease. Even if that means just... Just making up some lies and just get them arrested. Just get them to shut up. This is what's going to come upon you. And this is what we're constantly warned about. These types of troubles. People might lie about you, but you know what? Don't get out of God's will. God can protect you. God can save you. But whatever it is, it's going to be God's will. Let's finish up the chapter here. Verse number 15 just says, And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been, the face of an angel, which is, which is pretty amazing. So they're, they're looking at this guy, and it's just like, all of a sudden, he just looks like an angel. I mean, this guy is walking in the Spirit. This guy is doing what God wants him to do. And we're going to see in Acts chapter 7, he starts giving this, this, he starts preaching this great sermon. I mean, 
he goes, uh, well, we'll get into it. I'm not going to preach it right now. He gets into an Acts chapter 7 and, um, and really lays it out for him. And it's, it's really interesting. It's got a lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of good stuff in there. But Stephen is a great man of God. He was walking in the role that God had laid out for him in God's will. He had a certain specific role within the church. He was one of the deacons. He had a job to perform, and I believe he performed it very well. And there was nothing better for him to be doing and for the church to thrive and for the church to grow and for people to get saved and for all these things to be done when he was in his spot and when everybody else was in their proper roles doing what they're supposed to do. And you say, Pastor Burzins, I'm in this church. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, there's a lot of things that, for one, they don't even require a special gift. One of them is, is preaching the gospel, trying to get people saved. The Bible nowhere says that there's a special gift to open up your mouth and to give the gospel of Christ and to just tell people about Jesus Christ. That is a job, that is a role for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's saved in this church to do. That is all. That is every single Christian's responsibility. That is a great place to start. But apart from that, there are lots of other things that you can do. Like I said, you know your own talents, you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses. Focus on your strengths. And, and whatever it is you can do. I mean, ministering to other people and helping other people out are a great thing that you can do within the church. Someone else might have a need that you can help. I mean, if there was a, a, a mechanic in here, which I don't think there is, but if there was a mechanic in here who's really good with his hands and understands cars and understands how to fix them, and there's another person in the church, they're having car problems or whatever, you can offer to help that person out. You know, I mean, I'm good with computers. Someone else is having a computer problem. I can go out and help that person out because that's one of the skills that I have. You know, use different things and, and to help other people out within the church, but also use them. You know, I'm using my skills as a com with, uh, with computers to try to, to, to get more reach, to try to reach more people, to try to bring, you know, record the sermons and put them online and just and try to do whatever I can to get the message out. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different things that we can do, um, you know, to do that to, and to further the gospel and to kind of just further and help the church and to, and to minister to people. So um, wherever you're at in the church, just the one thing you definitely need to be doing is, is trying to win souls and learn more and, um, and be happy with where you're at and, and also try to grow, grow, you know, try to learn more skills. Um, sometimes a lot of people don't even know what talents God's given them because they haven't tried certain things. You know, you, you don't necessarily know how good you are if you've never done it before or never even attempted it. Um, try, try learning new things. Try, try um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to try my hand at music. I'm not the best at it, but I'm going to keep on trying to do it because I want to learn. I want to be able to play, play the piano. But you don't know if you don't even get started on it. Maybe you do have some hidden talent that God's given you that you haven't even, that hasn't even come to the surface yet. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, 